Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for being here. I know this is the last session, so most of us are probably somewhat tired. So I really appreciate you all being here. Uh, right. My name is Umesh Tangat. I work for Yelp uh, mostly on their search infrastructure team. I've been with Yelp for around seven years now. Uh, during that time, I have led the rewrite of their search infrastructure a couple of times now. And in this talk, we will look into our latest incarnation uh, of our search engine. It's called Near Real-Time Search. So Yelp's mission is connecting people with great local businesses. Uh, as you can see, search is a very critical component of this, uh, the whole Yelp's mission. Here are some numbers to give you an idea of the scale that we operate at. Uh, and these are mostly as of the end of uh, Q421. We have over uh, 244 million reviews in various languages. All of these are indexed in a real-time way in our search store. There are 33 million unique uh, app devices. Uh, and the, the dub, dub, dub flow is separate. And then we have uh, billions of queries served per year. So back in 2019, I was here to talk about how Yelp moved its core search. Back then, it was based on Lucene but a really old version of Lucene, which didn't really support uh, real-time indexing and such. And we moved it to Elasticsearch. And I'm here today to talk about how we moved our core search to raw Lucene-based one away from Elasticsearch. So what's going on here? Other than we are keeping ourselves employed, I guess. Uh, but th there is more, as you can see in the talk. So like I mentioned, uh, and you can look at the details in the previous talk three from three years ago. Our search engine back then wasn't really a platform, didn't really have APIs. It was more like a black box. And it was really hard to query. It didn't have like extensibility uh, options or plugins. So we had very specific uh, ranking code, which we would run. And it didn't really scale out as we had more search-like teams at Yelp, ads and requester code. And essentially, all of these are ranking. And they want to do some kind of filter and ranking. Um, so Elasticsearch was great because it gave us extensible APIs, allowed us to do you know, uh, searching, indexing on those APIs, and also help the developers you know, with the operational aspects of it. Um, so troubleshooting was easy and whatnot. Uh, as a result, it made so search data a lot more accessible to a lot of teams. So people would query within search, uh, within, within Yelp, the people would query it for just the geo-based stuff or some simple... Uh, ranking scripts like painless or like really custom native, uh, uh, highly uh, extensible plugins like analysis and highlighting and ranking using ML and whatnot. So this led to a much wider adoption and extension. So with that came, like that's a good part, but then we kind of became a victim of our own success. So we have high search QPS, high indexing QPS. We have this like tiny team maintaining all these Elasticsearch clusters at Yelp. Uh, and the queries got computationally really heavy. So we had to keep adding nodes, uh, apart from like being you know, pressure on the on-call. Uh, and even after doing that, the performance was gradually declining. And we look at the, the details of this. So the first aspect is we had uh, cost challenges with Elasticsearch at Yelp. So Yelp uses AWS uh, for deployment, and we have a multi-region deployment. And Ops uh, likes to do region failovers. So we typically would run an exercise in production. We would fail over the entire region traffic. So for example, in AWS, we have a US West 2 region and a US East one. They would fail over entire region's traffic on uh, another region. So guess what this would do to our search clusters? Uh, so we needed to over-provision uh, capacity for peak traffic, uh, which meant it cost us more than it should have. Uh, and auto-scaling for Elasticsearch didn't really work for us because, as you can guess, it takes over of minutes for the nodes to come up, the data to migrate, you know, the shards to migrate, and we were serving 500 to our customers for minutes, which is not good for revenue, for happiness of customers, and other reasons. Then the other issue was Yelp. Uh, if you have used Yelp, is mostly a search, but more, most of the search queries are based off geo. Like you would search for a burrito in San Francisco or a burrito in New York. And as you can imagine, we have indexed at the application level based on the geography. So for example, not necessarily what we actually do in production, but you could have an index for San Francisco versus New York versus maybe Europe. But some nodes got really hot, meaning the shards of, of uh, let's say, San Francisco would end up 
on the same node. And then all of a sudden during lunch hour, San Francisco, those nodes would be hot. And we had the inverse problem when the nodes would be cold and they wouldn't get enough traffic. So although we, had spend, we were spending all this money, there wasn't really efficient usage uh, of the CPU. Uh, coming to the performance challenges we had at Yelp with Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch, as most of you probably know, uh, is document-based application. So every node essentially is an indexer and searcher. A node gets a request, which is the primary. It will index it. It will see how many replicas it has to go out to and uh, send the request there. Then they will do the uh, indexing as well. So higher indexing pressure means your search is slower. Your search is slower. And we often have a lot of these bad jobs which our uh, search data teams run in order to improve their signals. So you can see we have these bursts of like indexing all through the day. And so the instinct initially is, oh, search is getting slower. Let's bump the replicas. But that actually exacerbates the problem, because now you need to send that indexing message to more replicas, which means more indexing. And what makes matters worse is segment merging. Uh, because segment merging is a CPU and I.O. heavy operation, and every node is doing it. So often, on the crunch time, you would say, what's going on? Why is this node into red territory? And the JSTAC would uh, you know, most times reveal, oh, it's a segment merge. Uh, besides this, we had maintenance challenges, like I mentioned before. We were a small team, uh, maintaining a lot of Elasticsearch clusters now for various uh, clients, like ads, search, request code, and others. While Yelp operates, uh, Yelp has a dedicated infrastructure team which supports stateless deployment of containers, microservices. Uh, as of today, it's built on uh, Kubernetes. So we couldn't really use this. Uh, we had to use our own team, uh, primarily because we were not deployed uh, in a stateless uh, ecosystem. Back when we were doing this, Elasticsearch did have like the K8S, K8S operator, Kubernetes operator. Uh, but the issue we had was we needed to persist the data. So we had to make a stateful deployment, which meant uh, in the Amazon world, we had to use the uh, block store, the EBS. Uh, and we had severe like IOPS issues in the past with this. Uh, because like I said, our uh, search is heavily model uh, based. We use doc values in Lucene for searching, so it got really slow. Um, so that wasn't an option. So the question really was, can we deploy our search clusters in pure stateless mode? So if you take a step back uh, and look at what problems Elasticsearch tries to solve for us were the search functionality, essentially the filter you know, or the recall and sort or the rank, and the cluster orchestration and management, which solves the whole scalability, redundancy, availability problem. Uh, and really, these problems should be taken care of now by a container management system like Kubernetes. For this to happen, we had to answer these two questions uh, with affirmative. One was, can we truly have stateless uh, slash ephemeral instances? And two is, can we continue doing uh, indexing in real time? So this is where uh, Lucene really shined for us. Uh, uh, as most of you might know, Lucene's uh, write once only architecture uh, is really good. Uh, because once your segment is written, it never changes. And eventually, to do garbage collection of files, there's merging of files happening in the background to produce larger segments. Uh, and Lucene supports a near real-time API, which Elasticsearch does not as of now, because it uses a document-based application. So in a sense, to propagate the changes, we only need to copy uh, new files from server A to server B. Uh, and this is. Really, once you communicate which files need to be copied, the copying is left up to the implementer, how to copy the raw bytes over. Uh, this is where we thought we would you know, build this gRPC uh, server on top of Lucene, and we open sourced it uh, from the ground up. It's called a near real-time search, or NRT search for short. So we also have to keep in mind there are certain things we do not want to solve with NRT search. For example, we do not want to th do things like distributed leader algorithms to pick a new primary when the, when the current primary has crashed. Or we do not want to do load balancing to route the, the load to the least loaded replicas. This is taken care of uh, by the Kubernetes systems for us. And we are not a database. We don't pretend to be one. The, we do not have transaction logs. So the durability concerns are pushed back to the clients. And they would need to maintain their offsets. So between two commits, if you crash, uh, if the primary crashes, your data is lost, so you've got to go replay your offsets from the past last commit. So with this in mind, 
uh, this is a very simplified uh, view of our architecture where the primary only taking an indexing request uh, and on commits slash refresh intervals, we upload them to the remote file storage, which in our case is AWS S3. The replicas are different Kubernetes pods. Uh, these are stateless containers. When they come up, they download uh, data from S3. And for the real-time uh, part, we the primary syncs with the replicas. Uh, we currently use gRPC implementation for this, uh, for the uh, NRT updates. So what are the performance characteristics of this architecture in production now that's been running for a while? We use the S3 VPC endpoint for better performance because it cuts down the congestion on the network, especially for the amounts of data we are downloading. Uh, for the write to disk, we wanted to make the bottleneck as a network host capacity and not the write speed of the disk. So we have to use SSDs. So this allows us to basically go as fast as possible on the network host, uh, and we can bootstrap in off seconds um, for new nodes. And optionally, for some workloads, we do use compression, the LZ4. It doesn't compress it that much, but it's pretty good, uh, efficient in the CPU. So that's the reason we chose LZ4. The performance characteristics on the indexing side now, we do use incremental indexing, again, thanks to uh, Lucene's uh, write once uh, only architecture. You really need to upload only the new files, and then you need to maintain a state file, which gives you the current list of the names of the files. Um, and we upload it to S3 on Comet, like I mentioned before. And another interesting part is the segment merging is only there on the primary. Uh, and NRT itself, the API, uh, has the option of doing the segment merging, not installing the segment yet, and letting the replicas know beforehand, hey, this is the new segment available. You might not want these. And once they say, OK, we have it, then that's when you uh, switch the uh, index reader to use the new segments. Now, finally, the performance characteristics on search. So now, as you can see, we've taken away all the work from the search uh, requests. So the CPU is mainly freed up to serve search requests, um, apart from copying over the NRT updates from primary. And we can truly scale the replicas as a part of an auto-configured microservice uh, by just you know, changing our uh, uh, configs. And then the other thing we added, uh, which Lucene again supports, but Elasticsearch did not. Uh, I pulled up this ticket, and last I saw it's still open, was concurrent searching over segments. So what happens in Elasticsearch is a search in a shard is single-threaded. So a shard itself is essentially a Lucene index, which has multiple segments. Uh, but Lucene does allow you to search parallelly over those. So the way it does it by default is you divide the index into segment slices, you execute the slices with a thread pool, and then you reduce the results. So that makes our CPU uh, usage even better um, for the replicas. So how did this work out in practice? The graph on the top uh, is our Elasticsearch uh, deployment. I have erased the axis uh, for you know, reasons that we cannot uh, show the stuff in details. But anyway, so the, the, y, the x-axis is the time, and the y-axis is the traffic uh, over time. As you can see, our traffic varies a lot between time of the day and day of the week. And the red line is the capacity at which we had to provision our Elasticsearch cluster. So that you can see the gap between the troughs of the waves and the red line is all the wasted capacity. Uh, and the bottom, you can see our initial deployment of an RT search, where you can see how the traffic is closely being matched by the capacity. So this uh, has helped us like reduce costs by as much as up to 50% uh, in production. And we are also, while reducing the costs, are able to get 50% uh, uh, faster across various percentiles. And I have a timings graph on the next slide. In addition to that, now deploying stateless containers is a breeze. It's a microservice push. So doing things like JVM upgrades, OS upgrades, we are not like a month-long project. Or when we have security bugs like the log4j, it's the simple change in the jar uh, you know, and push the code. So going back to the timings. The green line, so these are timings for P50s, P99s, P95s. The green line is the NRT search timings. The blue line is the previous Elasticsearch timings. And the Y axis essentially is trying to plot the difference in percentage, again, because we cannot show the actual uh, latency. And you can see it's as much as up to 50%, uh, but at least 30%. So of course, it was not all uh, rosy. We had issues in practice. 
So while the concurrent search works well, it had bad higher percentiles. And the reason being, the default way of executing this didn't really take into consideration the work distributed. It, took a, it put the segments randomly in a, uh, in a slice. So you could get unfortunate, and you can have a really large segment on a single thread doing its thing, while all other threads are like not doing much. So Andrew from our team came up with uh, virtual sharding. And what this tries to do is divide the work more uniquely across the, by counting a live doc count. So essentially, we split the segments in buckets such that each bucket gets segments. So you could get smaller segments like lumped up in a bucket versus having a, a larger segment in another bucket. So this changes that we have to ch change our uh, merge policy for this. You could only, you would not ever really merge into one segment, but you would have n. If you have n buckets, then you would have n uh, least segments. Uh, but this gives us more predictable uh, timings across different percentiles. And uh, the other issue we uh, had was the fan out factor, because uh, like I mentioned, our current uh, method of getting the primary to talk to replicas for the NRT was just you know, synchronous communication using gRPC. And some of our workflows had a fan out factor, because the primary would send the update to replica one, then replica two, and so on. So if you have really a high number of replicas, then the network capacity of that host would be an issue. But it's straightforward to fix, and we're working on it in that we use the channel, uh, the gRPC channel only for the metadata, but the actual bytes can, like I mentioned, Lucene leaves up to the implementer. So we plan to draw that from S3 because we already have them. The other issue was the indexing model, like I mentioned before. The indexer has to now be aware of pulling the data from somewhere, example, Kafka, doing the uh, commits back to Kafka. Uh, and we saw not all our clients within Yelp were like really comfortable doing this, so the better model would be you pull instead of a push, like you have an ingestion plugin, and then you can configure you know, the offsets and maintain all that stuff internally in the plugin, uh, and just leave the configuration to the client. And also, we had some fun uh, rough edges and bugs, both in NRT and gRPC, <coughs> like buffer limitations and configurations. Uh, like I mentioned uh, throughout, we have a lot of custom plugins. So we have this gRPC-based API, which we also have a gateway to do Rust. But this gets very verbose, kind of similar to Elasticsearch almost. And it'll be nice to, we're working on like simplifying that for some of the clients. So where are we going uh, with this? So the future within Yelp, like I mentioned, we continue to migrate some of our lagging ES-based workloads to NRT Search. Uh, and there's a lot of feature work going on, like I mentioned in the previous slide. And we're supporting uh, other things like, we already supported a vector search. Uh, within uh, NRT search this past quarter, and now we're working on neural nets uh, as plugins as well. And outside Yelp, I've spoken to a few engineers and a few companies, and they've shown interest in doing kind of a similar approach where they were seeing issues with their Elasticsearch cluster uh, getting more expensive, and if they could really deploy it in a stateless manner. Uh, and one of the things, uh, the common things we, uh, common grounds we came to were the onboarding of this could be a little I won't say overwhelming, but maybe a little cumbersome in that we have our own Kubernetes operator to deploy. But what I found out while playing with this was you could easily get this done by using Helm charts. I have a link there. Uh, and Helm charts, for those of you who might not be aware, is essentially a package manager for Kubernetes. So you simply upload your CRD files, configuration files, the primary replica, and like what readiness probe, liveness probe, what volume, volume mounts, all the other spec you want. And uh, then you can, over, uh, you can download those from a common repository and just uh, override with your own values.yaml file. So that's, that, that works out pretty well. Uh, then the next thing we're thinking of doing is going one step further and almost make it a cloud native offering by you know, deploying this as a service within different uh, marketplaces. Uh, these are the resources, that's the code, uh, the engineering blog post we wrote, which was a year or so ago, but most of it is still relevant. We're also hiring, and uh, yeah, that's all the information there. And that's all I had. Thank you. Thank Do you, Umesh. Time for questions? Yes, we have time okay. for questions. Anyone who would like to start? Come on, don't be shy. We have a big crowd here. Oh, there's the back. Hi. Um, 
I'm just wondering sort of what what size index, what's the sort of index size you're working with and how does that sort of affect cold starts and restart of readers and I guess the writers as well? So the index sizes for the cluster. So yeah, like I said, yeah. this is a simplified version. Um, do we operate like uh, most of our workloads are, like I said before, are geo shardable. So we essentially deploy this like a micro cluster for the geo sharding uh, spec. So you can think of it like Oh, like all the, I don't know, US West could be in one shard, micro shard. And then we have a gateway in front of that to route the traffic accordingly. That's one mode. And then the other mode where geo sharding isn't that possible. So in this case, there would be like gigabytes. So we, we have used hosts up to like 25 gigabytes per second. And then they don't really have a problem downloading the data. Uh, but the indexes go up to, so we try to stick to, uh, the index size, the limiting factor is the RAM on the machine available. So like maybe 60 gigs or 120 gigs, because we, like I said, we use a lot of dock values. And Lucene is very happy to like, you know, use a disk cache. So that's the limiting factor there. And then for other workloads where, which are not geo sharding friendly, we have a scatter gather mode. It's typical, you know, like what ES does. So we have another node in front, which would, you know, scatter gather, that kind of thing. Thanks. Hi, thanks. Very, very nice talk. Thank you. Um, I, I have a question about uh, how often you are um, pulling the NRT updates because uh, the main uh, idea behind uh, the indexing on the different, uh, on, on all the replicas in Elasticsearch is because you can much faster reopen the index like once per second. Mm -hmm. uh, how often, but, but the problem here is if you, for example, have a large merge, it might take a lot of time to transfer those segments over the network. So what, what is your intended time to refresh uh, the index then? So right. because it's not near real time anymore in that case, or it depends on the definition. So, if what I'm trying, so if I'm trying to understand a question, you're saying this is the bottleneck is going to be our segment merge time, right? Yeah. Uh, and as far as I know, like the NRT, within the NRT, there is an API for the pre-warm, the segment merge. So whenever the primary is ready, uh, it will merge the segments and do it. And I want to say, like, we've worked with a, you know, refresh interval of seconds, like order of seconds, and that seems to work fine for the most part. Okay, thanks. Uh, hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, I have a question related to the auto scaling and when the there is a new pod started on the Kubernetes or like the GVM is usually cold and there is like a latency spike instead of things getting better they are getting worse because the GVM is cold and you cannot quickly execute the queries. Do you do some sort of warm up? So no, like we used to do this on the past, the previous 30 years ago, Lucene version. And I think the issue back then was twofold. Like when we started up a node, a, our heap size was big. So we did all this loading and we had stored fields, which were very JVM heap happy. That's not the case now. We have doc values, which are basically, you know, in the disk. Uh, and there is a preload kind of option uh, for doc values, uh, which we use for, you know, those file types. And the heap is really small now. We don't have like much stored fields. So there is not much garbage collection happening at the start. So that's not a reason for slowing. Like the S3 download, I said right to S3, like that's really bottom like. Uh, but the JVM process itself is happy and the doc values mean, and if you preload them, then the initial queries are not that slow. And we don't really need to warm. I want to say like we might have like a warming like application here and there, but typically we don't need. Like warming, but course. not about the warming of the caches and I/O and things, but mm -hmm. more about the GVM itself. Like it's just interpreting the bytecode instead of compiling and running it. We didn't like uh, have seem to have an issue with that. Um, the, you're talking about like order of seconds, minutes here. Like what's the so the first issue? query is usually takes much more time than the one thousandth query. Uh, I don't see like recollect having that issue because uh, we also have in Kubernetes this uh, you know uh, liveness probe. So our liveness probe itself has a bunch of thing going on, which probably does like uh, it doesn't do warming specifically, but it does a bunch of like uh, pre-configuring things. Thanks. Yeah. 
Yeah, hi, uh, great talk. Um, I'm, my question is regarding the uh, ML plugins that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, how easy or hard was it for you to replicate the same behavior with, like earlier with Elastic and now with Lucene? Was it um, easy to do or hard to do or did it take a lot of effort? So, I mean, the TLDR is it was not too hard because we already had plugins. So when we build this stuff out, we one of the design goals was we need to deploy all this code. And we have uh, plugins not only for ranking, but for analysis and for you know, special things like highlights and collecting logs and whatnot. So we, what we have is we have a plugin architecture, it's extensible. So the plugins themselves are owned by the developing teams, not the search infrastructure team. But the APIs are owned by us. So they would just, when they start their cluster, they would just have to drop the jar in the right class path. And we have different class loaders loading this. Uh, but the API is in NRT search itself. Other questions? Then I have a question. Um, how do you decide uh, that uh, um, Lucene Row is uh, faster than Elastic? Did you make this evaluation on a bunch of data or you put both of them in productions and then uh, decided? Sorry, what's the question? How is the Elastic search no, query no, fast, slower than? Not how. Had, how did you decide? that uh, Lucene Row is faster than Elasticsearch. The, at the query time, you mean? Yes, yes. So we dark launched all this. So at the Yelp, whenever we launch like a new flow, uh, we, like, it's a microservice, like I mentioned. So whatever gateway I was talking to Elasticsearch now talks to this. We would dark launch it. Dark launch meaning we would send the query to the new thing, but we don't take the response. Uh, but we can collect the timings by the collectors. And so these timings are from that. And we have, we have to dark launch for not only performance reasons, but also functionality. We need to check if they're actually returning the same results or not. So that itself like, takes as much time to roll it out in production as building this stuff out. OK, thank you. Anyone else? OK. Uh, I guess a slightly related question, but what do you think is the main driver between the performance of the Lucene version and the Elasticsearch version? Because I guess mainly Kubernetes does the management and, well, yeah. What is the main performance yeah, factor? What, what, yeah, what is it in Lucene? So it's a few things like I mentioned, right? Uh, one is having a dedicated primary replica segregation, where the replicas are only doing the read now. And uh, doing other things. So it's a, it's, it's a collection of various things. So that's one. Uh, the other thing was uh, ha segregation. The other thing was not doing segment merges for an replica, for example. The third thing was like concurrent searching across segments. So you better utilize your CPU rather than having one thread run for one query. Uh, the next thing was we can, which I didn't mention, we have a geo sharding based approach. Uh, so the hot and cold issue we don't have because, like I told the other gentleman, now we have uh, multiple uh, of these microclusters, right? So you can have, let's say, San Francisco uh, lunchtime. So this microcluster could have more replicas. And then the Europe one would have scaled down. So you're better utilizing the CPU. So overall, um, that's you know, uh, cheaper. Um, and yeah, uh, writing to SSDs. And so it's, it's a collection of a lot of things, I guess. Um, one question about the, your um, Kubernetes um, uh, pods and and uh, and the nodes are all the nodes on Kubernetes or only uh, the the search nodes? Even the, uh, I mean the indexing nodes, they are only uh, also on Kubernetes. Yeah, everything and, is a, everything is a microservice. And, it, and, because okay. we use Kubernetes, it's on Kubernetes, but it could be. Anything. So, like, pr primary is a pod okay. with one, you know, replica is an auto scalable pod. And indexing and pods are also um, auto scalable? Sorry, which one? Indexing pods are also uh, auto scalable? So the no, so the indexer is only one, right? Okay. So, if it crashes, Kubernetes will bring up okay. so a different one. That's like only one per okay. We thought about it like having a shadow one, but then we'd have to have like Zookeeper, keep state, yeah. what's going on. So yeah, we yeah. And, and it's pretty fast for us to bring up a new one. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, you could have used uh, Solar almost. 
Sorry? You could almost have used solar in this case. Solar? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so back then, like the few things, so I'm not okay. sure like how we could do uh, write to S3, for example, or have a complete stateless architecture, like what we have here. Uh, right, we would still need persistence. Okay. And, and, and just another question, because I am not at all a specialist of AWS. You said at the beginning that uh, Kubernetes uh, uh, with Elastic was not an option because of EBS storage. Mm -hmm. um, what is the link between uh, Kubernetes and uh, EBS storage? Can you not use uh, SSD in this case? Local SSD, I mean. So we are using SSD now. Yes, but here. So if you use SSD here and it would go down, we would lose the data, right? We still need the data. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for the talk. Um, just one question about the fan out. You mentioned that you had a problem with fan out. Yeah. But at the same time, you said like you're using also uh, the queries executed, I mean, some of the queries at least are executed concurrently. Doesn't it hurt the fan out problem because you're going to have more variance, right? If you execute the, con the query concurrently and if you have more variance, the fan out is going to. So the fan out is an issue for the primary, right? All right. Uh, when the, where's the diagram? Yeah. So the fan out is the issue for the blue line, like the primary sending to multiple replicas. And then the issue really is the network capacity of the host. But the concurrent searching happens within the replica itself. So that's the better utilization of the CPU for the replica. So it's an IO bound thing. Sorry, it's a CPU bound thing. But the fan out is a primary network okay. bound thing. Anyone else? One last question? Yeah, I wanted to clarify what that ES issue you called out as, and just so I understand what you said, uh, it's that it's one thread per shard, and you can't parallel thread within segments within a shard. Right. So I don't know if ES has implemented this now. I, I think the ticket is still open. So the search that happens in the ES index is w every search request for every shard, single thread. The, the parallelism, unit parallelism is shards over there. But a shard essentially is a Lucene index, which is made up of multiple segments. And you can't search across segments in parallel in ES. So you're, you're essentially sh sh you would shard more, maybe, than the guidelines are to take advantage of all the threads you have. So you would you, like, you would increase the number of shards to match the number of threads available in a way, if you're going to try and maximize all of that CPU. So how you would solve this in ES? Yeah. Then you would have to have more shards, but as for, uh, I don't know if ES does like auto sharding now, but in ES before you had to do, you have to design a number of shards at the beginning, uh, and data can grow afterwards, and the shard actually runs on a separate node. So it's on a different machine. This is utilizing the scores on the same machine, the kind of like vertical scaling. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Let's give Umesh a big round of applause. Thank you.